beauty is something that uh, is, is, is a very creative concept and also at the same time something that we can um, evolve and therefore if we train our minds to respond in a certain way and for me now if sustainability is the way forward then we have to realign our concepts of aesthetic and our concepts of what we think beautiful to that. Villaroy and Bach presents the Design FM powered by Inglaze. Curated by Establish in association with Boeing. Hello and welcome to the Design FM. I'm Ferdin Bamgara from Established Design and today I'm sitting here with a renowned Indian designer who has in the last 23 years given us projects that are enviable. Sabira Rathod is not only an architect but also a teacher, writer, editor and a passionate furniture designer. Welcome to the show Samira. Thank you. Samira, uh, as someone who is so deeply involved in the design process, I want to understand how do you see the design scenario changing in the current context? Fardeen, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, and your question is very valid, I think. Uh, it's about time that uh, all of us designers, architects, uh, start looking at the idea of design uh, or, and rethinking our entire sort of programmatic um, uh, e and programmatically evaluate what we're doing. The, the world across is changing uh, with climate change, uh, okay. the onslaught of climate change. I think our response as architects to building has to change drastically. Uh, we have to start looking at design in more sustainable ways. How are we responding to these different um, scenarios? And the most important thing I think that design now has to really um, take cognizance of the changing climate and um, what it brings with it, but also at the same time learn or work towards adapting uh, and mitigating. That is true because like the whole global boiling point that we were talking about, which we predicted like at least decades ahead, we're it's already happening. there. Yeah, we're we're already we there. have so wildfires, we have floods going on unprecedented. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, how do you see sustainability fit into the current context, like uh, in terms of design and aesthetic today? How much contribution is sustainability coming into it? Uh, for these are two major ways in which you can look at this. Uh, in my opinion, I think the larger aspects of really responding to sustainability uh, would have to be policy driven. So that's something that the government has to take charge the world government has to take charge, world organizations have to take, take charge and ensure that you know, we are really not depleting uh, resources, that we are really looking into rewilding and that's a huge, huge, huge area of work and how fast can we get there? I don't know, I really don't know. I, I mean, as an individual, I'm unable to really comment on that. But then on the other hand, what can I do? What can I do as an architect? What can I do as, as just a citizen? Uh, what can I do as, as a citizen of the planet? And I think, like I mentioned before, I think the two most immediate things that we have to do is to adapt. To adapt to um, what can be foreseen as the new uh, problems that we're going to face. And these problems may not be small. It's like, okay, there's going to be floods. There's going to be extreme heat. There's going to be extreme cold. There's going to be a lot of rain. Um, so how do I build A to first adapt to all these situations and then secondly how do I build to mitigate these situations. So I think even as far as mitigation is concerned I think there's seriously uh, that needs to be uh, coming as a policy that has to be coming as decisions from the government to say our cities will now respond in this way, our cities will now have this much space available our cities are now going to be, um, you know, landscapes and parks and the cities are also going to adapt principles of rewilding. Um, so the, even simple things like a park with one kind of tree is no more the right thing to do. A park with too many trees is also not the right thing to do. So um, there is science, there is, you know, a data available of what needs to be done. And uh, some things are being done in a big way. So, I mean, we know for a fact that large amount of area is being given out um, say for instance in Delhi 
to 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 be a forested um, in the middle of a city. So you have 300, 400 acres that, that are turning into forests. I mean, that's the right thing to do. Uh, we have to be careful not to destroy our mangroves because that for Bombay, that's the big thing. Correct. Uh, but that those have to be policy decisions. Um, on the other hand, as an architect, uh, my job is to ensure that if a client comes to me, how do I help him relook at the ideas of what makes a building sustainable? I mean, the first thing for sustainability would be do not build. Let okay. us not build anymore. We've got enough. So if I still want some new space, and then I have to recycle. Or there's adaptive reuse. Adaptive reuse also has its own pros and cons. Sometimes it works beautifully. Sometimes you're not really leasing any more life to the building. So it's better to then demolish. And then if you're going to demolish, I'll say dismantle. So when you dismantle, you kind of retrieve material. Uh, you retrieve um, uh, elements of the building. And you can reuse them without adding uh, more embodied energy into, into it. So you can actually work with that. Reducing your carbon footprint. Exactly. So there is this whole idea of recycling uh, those materials. And I don't mean pounding everything to a powder and then you know recasting it. But sometimes actually using the um, elements in their actual form and be able to reuse it and work with those ideas. So you're really not uh, depleting more resources. Another way is to look at um, newer kinds of material. Uh, one more way uh, is to really look at this idea of, say, passive energy uh, uh, mechanisms to ward off, um, you know, heat or cold and making space more uh, passive energy efficient uh, and making these buildings therefore use and consume less um, energy, artificial energy and electricity. So it, I, I think it's extremely complex and it's all, all kind of interwoven, but uh, yes, it needs to be addressed. And um, that might lead to a complete new way of adjustments, uh, not just physical, because that of course we have to do, but uh, adjustments even in terms of how we perceive uh, our aesthetics. So I think there needs to be a huge shift and uh, it all comes with being open. Okay, so this shift in aesthetic, uh, it's, it's normally defined by beauty, right? How is it that the definition of beauty has changed over the years? And how is it possible for us to incorporate these older definitions in the modern times? Because with any kind of change, these definitions also somewhere need to change. Be it sustainability, be it contextuality, we need to bring in elements that you know, fit the current definition of beauty, not the archaic one. So in terms of materials, how you mentioned, mm. I believe you have a project in Baruch which has attained a lot of the sustainable factors, um, 10 degrees lower than the outside temperature. Yeah. How That's did right. you go about with this? How did you bring this into uh, being? Sure. So I'm going to answer the first part of your question when, since you, you know, brought up the idea of beauty and that's something that's uh, been very close to uh, what I work with, or struggle with, and that's been like kind of um, core to the idea of my practice. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, I mean, beauty has been kind of core to existence. Like, it's always been around. Okay. Uh, I think it's one of those rare traits uh, that distinguishes the human race from other animals because we understand beauty or we we want to make things beautiful and that we respond to the idea of beauty. Um, the fact that a beautiful landscape, uh, mountains, sunrise, early morning has never stopped universally astounding the human mind. I mean like across the board, any given age, that is going to be something that a human being is going to say, wow, re to respond to. So it, it does like strike a chord. Yeah, it's like, so there is, there is a general sense of beauty that we all respond to. Um, the other aspect of beauty is something that uh, we, we kind of train ourselves uh, to appreciate and grow with. That's constantly sometimes changing. Uh, I mean, look at fashion, right? Uh, what's good a decade back is not 
the in thing anymore and you adapt and you say this is not trending, this is not fashionable, this is not. And there are certain ideas that just don't change. I mean, and also that it's, it's the whole thing is very cyclic. So even if you look at um, fashion, it's cyclic. I mean, it keeps coming the back. So back. This is, uh, how much can you do, right? Uh, but maybe that's not the perfect example I should be mentioning. But what, what I'm trying to say is that there is constantly an evolving idea of beauty. Now, usually, I would think that beauty is something that uh, is, is, is a very creative concept and also at the same time something that we can um, evolve and therefore if we train our minds to respond in a certain way and for me now if sustainability is the way forward then we have to realign our concepts of aesthetic and our concepts of what we think beautiful to that. So natural materials, textures, allowing of patinas can be your new wave aesthetic. Recycling and therefore um, looking at the idea of compositions, looking at the idea of how materials come together can also be a new way of looking at um, the aesthetic or the idea of beauty. <laughs>
of sustainable oh. social media. Yes, and of, of uh, since you asked about beauty, a new definition of what we call beautiful, right? It's, it's not anymore the perfect chiseled um, face, nose, perfect eyes, but it's something that's more soulful, something that, that is more comfortable, that's something that's more easy to deal with. I mean, something that you would probably say for relationships, you know, you have extremely uh, beautiful person to look at, wow, lovely, but the most difficult sometimes to live with. And then your sense of uh, love is redefined in the same way sense of beauty is about being more soulful, uh, more sensual, and now I would say more sustainable. You asked me about the Bharuch house. Yeah. And the Bharuch house, um, rightly, uh, was designed with a very, very sustainable approach. Um, so every act in that project has been one that has been derived from uh, asking the question, how does this help in terms of uh, comfort, thermal comfort, how does it help in terms of uh, being comfortable within the house, uh, how, how does it consume energy, uh, and how is it going to be durable, and in all of that, um, the aesthetic is different, because when I'm responding very honestly, the aesthetic is what is derived from that approach. So there's no uh, additional effort to try and make something beautiful by a layer on it, or it's not pastiche. Yes, it, it's the coming of a result of what we were uh, attempting to do. So you, you basically let the functionality define the aesthetics? Uh, so more, so. Yes, uh, maybe the functionality also is defined by the approach of uh, what is the right thing to do in terms of sustainability. Interesting. So sometimes even the function changes. Okay. And that's important that we adapt, we constantly adapt. So it's okay to adapt, it's okay to be different. You, you need to be a little agile mentally, I mean metaphorically also agile in the head so that you can adapt new concepts. Okay. And so you're shifting because that's, that's evolution. So you're evolving, I mean you're not stuck. And yeah. I think it's, it's extremely important now because it's happening very fast. True, the speed uh, at which. The speed at which there is change requires me to be more agile than ever before. So I, I need to constantly adapt. And yes, um, if I can talk about the materials of Baruch House or uh, the kind of um, strategies we used, uh, Baruch is an extremely um, uh, extreme kind of climate. So it's, it's very hot uh, and most of the time of the year. Uh, so it was essential that we were able to keep the heat out um, energy consumed by using air conditioners is, of course, um, something that we wanted to review, reduce, um, reconsider. And so the first thing was to use a uh, thermal mass. That means you have thick walls, uh, you orient the rooms correctly. We, well, the client we had was extremely mindful about these things. And he, he, he himself had said, you know, this is a perfect wind direction. I've lived in this house before because he had a house on that right. same property. So he said, I know this very, very well. So I, I'm sure of these wind directions. I need to capture this breeze into the house for me. So we did all of that. We created water bodies. The, you know, we have jallies that create the venturi effect for the breeze to come in, uh, passes through the water and really um, you get cool breeze like as if you're, as near the sea, so you're like, it, it's like sea breeze. And this was something that was, uh, in some sense, uh, a great happy surprise for me also, because I was sitting there in May, uh, in the middle of the summer, and the middle of the day, like two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, and it felt like you're in Goa, sitting on the beach with the breeze coming in, and things were flying off. So it was, it was we were able to capture and bring the breeze in, which was great. Um, there was a pool on the top, on the terrace, I'd created a kind of a garden that had plants that were more cooling okay. and soothing to the eye. Uh, so all the hot air would be taken up and the part of the building was painted black because of that. So there were these various uh, nuances that kind of each one played a little role in an overall comfort level that was really something that we never imagined we would get so easily. I mean. Every act was towards that. The house is plastered in lime on the inside that 
it really cools the building. Um, all the windows uh, in the south and the west side are extremely small and all the light in the building comes through two courtyards. So it's an extremely introverted building with dead walls on its side. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know, there's just various number of ideas that we used. But these things develop. So there has to be a good design development time or, or a phase that we give ourselves to create those ideas and to test them through uh, various apps, uh, test them through actual physical models, and then take it to the side. So you had a client who supported the idea, who went full steam with it. Are there clients as well who need to be explained how sustainability fits into their design and how do you go about it? Yes. <laughs> um, I think it took uh, one or two good examples um, to get more people convinced about it. So now that this Bharuch house uh, is being talked about a lot. It's got a lot of international publicity also. And then we actually had numbers uh, in terms of temperature differences. So 10 degrees, I believe. 10 degrees, yes, absolutely, um, which, which is amazing and uh, which was something that we never really imagined. We just thought we'd be able to reduce air conditioning. And here my client is saying we don't really need to use it as much. So that's, that's something that we've been able to do and that's got more and more people queued in uh, because the aesthetic of, the, of that particular project, that building, is uh, fairly in keeping with what people enjoy today. So it's not something that um, is difficult in terms of being able to live with. Right. And uh, it's, it's surprising because for people it's like, oh, this is actually sustainable. Um, I'm like, yeah, sure. And so, so there's a misconception about this whole idea of that if it is sustainable, it may not be in keeping with what I consider today comfortable uh, in term or it comfortable in terms of the kind of um, aesthetic that I'm looking at. But I think that whole idea of an overkill, the so-called bling, is changing. And when we, so your question was actually. How, how, how do I convince clients yeah. that... Um, I mean, do they need convincing to begin with? And if there is someone... Uh, increasingly less. Increasingly In less. I think that uh, across the board, the media is talking about sustainability everywhere. So now that there is this awareness that's happening within clients and the people consuming it, in terms of materials, uh, in terms of the choices that you have towards a sustainable path, how is, how is that developing? Is there more research needed at that end? Oh, Do we yeah, have yeah. materials with support? Does it make it easy for you? Fardeen, my office has not really worked with completely new materials. I mean, we are not scientists and we are not uh, uh, engineers that, or material engineers that, you know, work with completely new invention of new materials. Um, what we do is we just look at ideas, I mean, and those are available or those are available to inspire from through nature. Uh, also a lot of serendipity, uh, but also the sense of this that I want to be sustainable. And it's like they say, you know, if you, if you really want to do something badly, then the universe opens itself to you and presents itself with many opportunities and ideas. And I think some of that kind of happens. Um, to us also. And so um, what, what we really end up doing is um, work with age-old materials, but differently. Understood. Differently. Um, one of our projects, we've uh, been able to uh, look at the idea of debris. Right. So uh, actually this is the Kochi. Kochi Biennale, yeah. yeah. So two, two projects actually. So the Kochi Biennale, I was in Kochi and, uh, you know, Bose asked me uh, to do the pavilion and he invited me to Kochi. And my first visit was in, sometimes in June. Uh, and what I saw, it was just after COVID. So there was, this was the, the Biennale that was happening just after COVID I and uh, everyone was extremely nervous about will we pull it through. And when I went to Kochi, um, I, I, I was nervous too because what I really saw was uh, the entire town was completely disheveled. 
um, and a lot of buildings were coming off, so they were being demolished. Okay. And so there was debris, 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 debris. I'm like, hey, this is the new material that I have to use because there's just so much abundance of it. And um, the other thing I saw was these old, really old, beautiful uh, warehouses and large buildings with just kind of seamless, humongous roofs. Uh, and so these two ideas really struck uh, me as something that could uh, come together to create a pavilion. Um, so we actually used and created that pavilion completely out of natural local debris. There was a building that was coming apart right next to the site and I had tempos, little tempos coming in every day, every single day with loads of debris, debris from that site, just moved from there to here. And um, it was sustainable. I mean, in more ways than one, uh, we didn't have any footings. So when you remove a structure like that, you don't leave anything in the ground. Okay. Uh, it was uh, built very lightly. I didn't use any cement. So the walls were just um, uh, like Gabion walls, but instead of rock, I was using debris. debris. Uh, we sorted some of the brick debris from the concrete debris because they were all pounded into little rocks. So I got the brick separated. And with that, I used a coir, which was very naturally available in Kochi. So there's this whole idea of using the local. Uh, mixed a little bit of uh, brick powder, mud, and very little cement to create a kind of a slurry that we put on the roof. Uh, the roof was made out of geogrids which can resist a lot of movement. Oh, yeah. And so you could walk up the roof to fix it because one aspect of building is also how to build it. Um, so there was no use of machines. It was completely handmade. handmade. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, I had trees, old trees uh, used to support uh, some parts of the pavilion. Uh, the entire floor was made out of uh, sort of mud, cement, and uh, that same sort of brick powder uh, slurry uh, with uh, old um, wasted granite edge cuts, like they call them. When, because when, when they cut large blocks of granite, you have the, 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 the most extreme slice, uh, which is typically thrown away. Okay. But, and, but they have beautiful textures and forms, and so I actually use that in the flooring. So yeah, we did a lot of all of these things. And once again, what was most uh, wonderful is that in the middle of Kochi's summer, when the temperatures really get unbearable, people just came into the pavilion to feel cool. And that was lovely. So we had fantastic acoustics uh, because of the material we used. Um, it was cool, didn't leak, um, and um, great place to carry out all the kind of performances that they wanted to including um, film shows singing uh, lectures everything so yeah that's how you know you kind of rethink a new way of using something that's actually waste or but this is something we see across a lot of your projects there's a lot of contextual influence in yes. your projects, yes. you do try to source locally, you try to get things from local markets as well. So when we talk about contextuality, it's like a common theme across a lot of your projects. You are very aware of the local surroundings and you bring in aspects that are contextual to the site and to the location of the site. So how does that reflect beyond just the design, but in terms of like sourcing of materials, sourcing of labor? Are there any particular things you look into? How does it work? But in context is, uh, you know, a large overarching umbrella. I think it, it encompasses uh, many, many different uh, ideas and issues. Um, there's, of course, the context of the client. There's, of course, the context of the site. But there's also the context of culture. True. There's also the context of the region in terms of um, its geography, its people. Uh, it's 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 philosophy in that particular era, and I think when we look at the idea of context, I'm I'm mindful of almost all of these. It's it's the response to any building and how it should sit on a particular site, really comes from its immediate surroundings, and then how it's built comes from its um, what are the cultural influences here. You know? right. 
And that's that's kind of very nuanced way of uh, uh, bringing that into the building because there's no direct answer to it. I mean, at, at one level, level, you want to be modern, you want to be contemporary, but there is an underlying uh, inherent intrinsic idea of culture that cannot escape True. Uh, us as architects. So yes, um, if I have to translate that physically, then there's material that usually we try to source from the surrounding. So you really don't want to, you know, get um, marble from the north to building something in the south. Uh, so you're looking for material that's within a certain radius uh, of the site available from the site or from the region. And then that becomes extremely local. But there's one hand material. On the other hand, there's the component of uh, skilled labor. The skilled labor. I hate to use the word labor, labor, but that's what we've turned our craftsmen into today. You know, in the earlier times, um, there was a craftsman, there was a master craftsman uh, who would be extremely respected and revered, and he was set free to make buildings the the way he chose over generations. So his entire family would be dedicated to building, say, a particular temple. And today we've reduced that craftsman to saying we have architects now who will tell you what to do. And unfortunately, they've been turned into uh, faceless labor. You know, you don't even know their names anymore, okay. uh, which is sad. But having said that, um, if I have to still think of how do I mean local uh, and how do I mean local skilled workers, uh, it's important as architects we understand what their skills are. Different regions, different re people from different regions have different um, skills and crafts and that's important to um, kind of inculcate into your design and work with them, then rather impose uh, a skill from outside and say, you know, I just want this very sleek concrete building. Here. I don't care if you know how to make it, but learn it. And I learned this, um, you know, from a client that when I was struggling on site with, you know, talking to the to the to the worker, they're saying, "Why can't you do this? Here, look at the sample. Look at this." And both of us were struggling. My client was watching me having this conversation, and then he says, "You know, Samira, come here." So I said, "Yeah, what happened?" And he's telling me that maybe it might be an idea to work with a texture that he knows how to do, and that 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 was something that that was like, "Yeah, you're right. It just removes all the stress." And so you work with that idea. There's a certain sense of dignity you bring to the project when they enjoy doing what they enjoy doing. So I this, think this basically brings us brings us back to the fact that everyone needs to adapt. Yes, yes, you adapt, and so it's fine to say this is not like the international aesthetic. This is a regional aesthetic. This right. is what Kenneth Frampton called the critical regionalism several decades ago, and and I think. Now is the most important time to adapt to it, you know, to adopt it. So, yeah, that's what I mean by uh, contextual also. Um, there's also, like I said, the context of um, sustainability now, which is going to be a global phenomenon soon. And um, that's, that's also something that for me is, is the big underlying context uh, that's kind of universal now. So we need to work with that. And um, I, I don't know if I'm... No, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so what I also want to understand is now you've thought about this project in so much details. When you're presenting it to a client, do you run him through all the iterations that you've done in your head before suggesting the ideal design? Or is it that you're presenting just the ideal design? How does it work with the client and getting the client also I think on board with how you're thinking? Uh, yes. I, I think it's important that when a client um, comes in, the first meeting we have with them is we explain. We explain exactly what it will mean to work with us. All right. Do you have the time? Do you have the patience? What are your inclinations? What is the direction you're looking at? This is what we do. This is how we would like to take you through. Um, so there is, there is some clarity in terms of what their expectations are of us and what we're really going to do. Right. Um, so that's the first, first thing we kind of get across the table. Uh, the other important thing which sometimes I share and I don't is that uh, a lot, it depends on this mindset. There are clients who come in and want to really enjoy the process of design 
in which case, um, and, and our process is extremely iterative. I, I make models, uh, every time there's a small little change, even in a window, I'm like, redo, I need to see the model again. Because I personally believe that making models, and we never make models for the end product, I'm always making models during the process okay. of design because that's, they're only study models. They're, there's never real, the final model is the building itself. Okay. So you're not really making the perfect presentation model which a lot of them expect. And so right from the beginning, we're constantly telling them, this is not what we're going to give you, this is what we're going to give you. And somewhere in the process, they begin to enjoy it because then it's engaging, because I am asking them uh, to engage. Correct. And why wouldn't somebody want to intellectually engage with ideas? So some, some clients, some people engage uh, more to the poetics, some engage more to uh, budgeting, some engage more to um, the science of building, uh, the, the science of construction, for execution. Uh, so different people have different interests. Uh, since we're true to the process and since we're true at every stage, and there's really nothing that is made up to present, it's as honest as it gets, there is a very serious commitment and there's a very serious exchange, and this comes through, which is why clients then begin to enjoy the process. And that reflects in the project. And that re that reflects. It. And um, I must say that I've always learned more from my clients. Um, and I always tell them I'm learning with you because they all bring in uh, a certain level of expertise through their own experiences. Uh, they bring in certain freshness of ideas sometimes or they're more clearer in their heads than I am about their visions. And so they lead us through. Um, so I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a symbiotic process and I like clients to take interest. I don't want clients or I don't want to engage with somebody who says, just do it, finish it. Honestly. I want you that want engagement. Them to be a part yeah, of the I process. want them. And I demand that. I actually say, I need to have conversations with you because that feeds us. Correct. And then, it feeds the project, and then the project feeds them. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a chain, and that that needs to be fed. Honestly. So that's how um, we work. There's also this um, idea of the development of design. So there's never, I don't know what the finished product is going to look like. It's not like this final idea that's a Yoruka moment in the shower for me. I'm like, I'm going to build this building just like this. No, it's not like that. I think we work out several options in terms of form, in terms of the plans, in terms of uh, the function, in terms of materials, in terms of uh, the, all the passive energy uh, ideas that I talked about, in terms of the context that we discussed. And they all come as these little vignettes uh, or, or, or fragments of ideas okay. that slowly get woven in. And if you're true and you know, you are on the right path, it's amazing how it begins to uh, flow. Okay. And so I, I think the, the word flow is also now uh, something that uh, people have addressed as a phenomena that happens in terms of how you're using your um, creative abilities, where you have to get into the state of flow mentally, where things um, are, are kind of iterated and fall into place and you're engaged in a certain way where your brain starts to work in that direction and what they call you're in a, in a, a state of flow okay. where it's just then moving smoothly. So, and that comes when there is focus on a particular idea, you're undistracted and your entire body, mind, hands are all moving in the same direction towards a, a particular idea. This may sound a little kind of esoteric uh, and a little off the, scientific radar, but scientists today are saying that that does happen. So it's it's something, you know, we call intuition. Okay. Um, I, and earlier I used to be like, you know, her designs are extremely intuitive. And I think intuition is extremely logical, but happens so quickly. It's extremely rational, but it happens so quickly and it's so fast uh, in terms of how it is processed by the brain that it seems, um, you know, where did this come from, kind of. Uh, Interesting. But actually, it's, it's extremely rational. 
So it's how well you practiced it. And I'm assuming because you have been doing this for years, it does come more organically to you. It yes. does come. Yes. After some time, it's the first idea that is right. But it's just you've, you've processed it so quickly yeah. that you feel it's just an intuitive idea. But you go back and then you you know, sort of uh, test it or against all the odds. And it, it's probably the idea that comes out with more ticks and more pros than, um, the, others. than the others. So, um, and interestingly, a lot of times, the first idea uh, or the idea that we feel this is the one, this is the form the house should take, this is the form the building should take, uh, is something that after the whole circle that we move around, taking inputs from the clients, we come back to it. And then he's convinced because then he's like, yeah, you're right. You know, now it fits into all my uh, different requirements and you've got it. So, um, yeah, I, I think that also requires a certain kind of patience um, to say we'll... Requires a certain level of commitment as well. Yes, to say I will, I'll take you through this and we'll test it. We'll see your idea against what we think was right, but maybe, sure, I stand to be corrected. And so we take take people through that because we are sitting on the same side of the table. We're not across each other, Correct. so it, it's it's fun. You know, it's 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 lovely. It's extremely creative, and um, if clients get to unleash their creative uh, abilities. <laughs> I'm sure they want to be a part of the design. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we've spoken about the process, we've spoken about sustainability, contextuality. If I were to ask you to summarize, what is Samira Rathod's design philosophy? Wow. <laughs> How would you summarize uh, it? You know, long time back, Fardeen, uh, when I was thinking about uh, how would I really define or what are the ideas that define our, our design philosophy, I, I couldn't put it down as one sentence or one idea and and we came up with this acronym called blurs okay and you know blur is like well if you spell it at b-a-l-u-r-s blur is something that you don't see clearly or there's a certain ambiguity around it which is uh, open to interpretation and this whole thing about everything being you know there hammered down structured this is it and nothing more is something that has never gone down well with me. So okay. there's a certain kind of sense of um, incompletion that allows for growth, that allows for uh, evolution or how it, you know, you can change things. So that requires to be there. And so therefore blurs in, is one idea. But if you really look at blurs as B-L-I-R-S, which is an acronym coming out of the kind of ideas that I'm committed to. Right. B would be for beauty. L is local. I is indigenous. R is recycle, responsible, relevant. And S is the most important, small. So small, not just in footprint, because that's the first idea of sustainability. Build less, build small, or don't build at all. Um, so, so small, but also small details. I know, get into the nitty gritty, get into the small ideas, get into the little things that make the difference. And then, you know, things will last forever. So there's a certain sense of timelessness to it. So this blurs as the acronym, but blurs as the idea also of, of leaving things a little less lucid. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samira. This has been insightful. Thank you. Getting Thank you for having me. It was wonderful chatting with you. Yeah.